Welcome to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. This podcast is devoted to helping increase your daily exposure to God's Word with a short scripture reading and brief commentary on key ideas, themes, and theology in each chapter. Now please join your host, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. Well, welcome back to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And today is May 5th, and today we're going to look at Exodus 20, 22 through 26. And just as a reminder, every day I read from one chapter of God's Word, and then I offer a brief explanation of key ideas, themes, and the theology in that chapter very briefly. My goal is to get you into God's Word for about 5 to 20 minutes every day. And this is the last uh, show in our series going through the Ten Commandments, and we're going to be back uh, tomorrow going through one chapter every day. So let's look today at Exodus 20, uh, 22 through 26. And Exodus 20, 22 through 26 says this, And the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the people of Israel, You have seen for yourselves that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make gods of silver to be with me, nor shall you make for yourselves gods of gold. An altar of earth you shall make for me, and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. If you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stones, for if you wield your tool on it, you profane it. And you shall not go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness be not exposed on it. Well, this is our reading today from Exodus 20, 22 through 26. Did God give Israel his law? The Bible says that in the days of Moses, God descended on Mount Sinai with fire and smoke, and that with a loud voice he issued the Ten Commandments. But is it really true? Does Exodus 19 through 20 provide an accurate account of something that actually happened in human history? Well, today, many scholars suggest that this isn't the case. They argue that the story of the Exodus is not fact but fiction, a story the Israelites made up to explain where they came from. And so, in the words of one popular rabbi, the story of the Exodus did not happen the way the Bible depicts it, if it happened at all. Archaeology and biblical history have demonstrated that the Bible is not intended to be taken as literal history this a rabbi argues it is a spiritual history and that is the way modern people ought to relate to the biblical text and so if the critics are right and the exodus is a fairy tale then this overturns the law of god either god spoke to israel from mount sinai or he didn't and if he didn't then the ten commandments do not come from him at all they are merely the product of human legislation written from the pen of moses rather than the finger of god and in that case, whatever obedience we offer is a matter of personal preference rather than holy obligation to the sovereign will of the Almighty God. The question is, did God give Israel his law? Did he really speak to his people from the mountain? This question may perplex some scholars, but it would have not posed any difficulty for the Israelites who knew what they had seen and what they had heard. The Israelites uh, were, were given both visible and audible signs of the presence of God. They saw his mysterious glory and heard his mighty voice. Did God really give them the law? Well, he did. No one who was there at Mount Sinai could ever deny that the law came from God. God reminded his people of this when he said it very clearly to them in Exodus 20:22. And from this point on, Moses would do the talking. Moses was a mediator, the man who spoke for God. So whenever God had something to say to Israel, he would do it through his prophet Moses. And in the chapters that follow, Moses applied God's law to various life situations. But the first thing God wanted his prophet to do was to remind the people who spoke to them on the mountain. It was the great God of the covenant. And from this point on, everything Moses said was based on this great fact that God had spoken to his people. The law did not come from the earth. It came from heaven. And for this reason, the Israelites were obligated to obey. 
People sometimes wonder whether God has really spoken to us. Perhaps he spoke to Moses, but does he still speak to us today? Well, the answer is yes. He speaks to us in and through the word of God of the Old and the New Testaments. The Ten Commandments were not just for the Israelites back then. They are for us right now, today, in our time, and in our space. Sometimes we're tempted to doubt this because we weren't there. We did not see what Israelites saw on the mountain or hear what they heard. But we do have the Word of God, which contains an exact record of what God said at Mount Sinai, as well as a complete account of everything else He has done for our salvation. And there are many reasons to believe that the, what the Bible says is true. It is an ancient book preserved in reliable manuscripts, which explains in a straightforward way what people experienced when they met with God. History and archaeology confirm the historical accuracy of the Word of God, but it still takes faith to receive it as the Word of God. If you would like more on this, I want to encourage you to pick up my book um, at the Servants of Grace store, The Word Matters. I talk about the authority of the Bible and much more in that book about the matters that I just discussed. Now, here we have an advantage over the Israelites. Usually we think they had all the advantages. After all, they were witnesses and they heard God's voice for themselves. But we have the Holy Spirit today. He is the one who inspired the word of God in the first place. And now he testifies that the Bible really is the word of God. Theologians call this the inward witness of the Holy Spirit. It is God confirming his own word in the mind and the heart of every believer. This is how God communicates with us, by the Holy Spirit speaking in the word of God. The Westminster Confession of Faith helps explain this aspect of the Spirit's work when he says starts saying this. First, the confession it lists reasons to believe that the Bible is the word of God. Saying this, we may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a high and reverend esteem of the holy word of God and the heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of this doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God, the full disclosure, discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation and the many other incomparable excellencies and the entire perfection thereof are arguments whereby it doth abundantly evidence itself to the word of god these are some of the many reasons for thinking that the bible comes from god its reputation its theology its style its consistency these things all confirm that god is the one who speaks to us in the word now, reason can only take us so far. Accepting the Bible as the word of God is not simply a matter of the intellect. It's also a matter of the heart. It takes faith to hear the voice of God, and this faith is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so the Westminster Confession goes on to say that our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and the divine authority of the Bible is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. So when we accept the Ten Commandments as a law of God, we are not simply taking Moses' word for it. We are taking the Spirit's word for it. God himself testifies to the truth of his own word. He says to us today what he said to his people at the mountain in Exodus 22:22. You have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. See, God has spoken to us as clearly as he spoke to Israel. We do not regard the Ten Commandments as a cultural relic, a legal code from an ancient past. On the contrary, we receive them as God's living word, believing that we too are commanded to serve God and love our neighbor. People say that seeing is believing, and this was true for the Israelites. God reminded them of what they had seen so they would take him at his word. But for the people of God, seeing is never just believing, it is also worshiping. Getting a clear sight of God always brings us to the point of praise. And we've observed this pattern throughout our study of the book of Exodus. God's people are saved for God's glory alone. And so whenever the Israelites had some new experience of God's saving grace, they always responded in praise. And so after reminding his people of what they'd seen, God proceeded to give them further instructions pertaining worship. Now, the first instruction concerned idolatry in Exodus 20, 23. Do not make any gods to be alongside of me. Do not make for yourself gods of silver or gods of gold. Well, this verse sounds familiar because it restates the first and the second commandment. The Ten Commandments begin with God commanding the Israelites not to have any other gods and not make any idols. Here, these commandments are virtually repeated. 
and is also attempting to skip over them on the assumption that we already know all about idolatry. But rather than ignoring things that the Bible repeats, we ought to give them special attention. God thought it was important to warn the Israelites against the great sin of idolatry more than once. Now, we need to hear this warning again and again and again because we are tempted to worship false gods. Or, to put it another way, we are tempted to let other things fill up the space in our lives that God ought to occupy. To identify our own idols, it helps us to ask ourselves questions like these. What am I hoping for? What am I counting on? What gives my life meaning? Where do I get my personal sense of worth? What am I thinking about? What am I working for? What makes me feel good? Where do I turn when I need comfort? Well, these are all questions we need to keep asking because it is so easy for us to manufacture other gods, the lesser deities we love and serve. The truth is, is that God alone deserves all glory. One cartoon depicts Moses standing on the mountain saying, no other gods before you. That's going to make us look pretty intolerant. And of course, it is intolerant. God will not tolerate any other god. He refuses to share his own glory. If the other gods deserved any glory, it would be wrong for God to be so intolerant. But there are no other gods. And so God commands us again and again not to act as if they were. Certain aspects of God's instruction about idolatry here are new. One is the mention of silver and gold. Now, the second commandment focused on what idols are supposedly to represent. Ancient idols were made in the form of things up in the heavens, down on the earth, and under the sea. They represented various celestial objects as well as birds, animals, and fish. But here the emphasis falls not on what idols represent, but on how they're made. Now, in those days, most idols were made of silver and gold. Some were cast entirely of some precious metal. For others, a thin overlay of metal was pressed down over a wooden figure. Well, either way, the precious metal was part of the attraction. Idols were something to look at. They had a visual appeal. This was true in our own day as well. People are attracted to the glamour and the glitz. What, what catches our eye is a colorful image, the flickering screen, what essayist John Seberg calls buzz. Now, to explain what he meant by buzz, Seabrook describes his experience of living and working in New York City. The air was fuzzy with the weird yellow tornado light of the Times Square by day, a blend of sunlight and wattage, the real and the mediated, the color of buzz. Buzz is a collective stream of consciousness, a shapeless substance into which politics and gossip, art and pornography, virtue and money, the fame of heroes and the celebrity of murders all bleed. In Times Square, you could see the buzz that you felt going through your mind. I found it soothing just to stand there on my way to and from work and let the yellow light run into my synapses, he says. And in that moment, the world outside and inside my school became one, he says. Now, usually we're tempted to laugh at the ancient pagans for their primitive worship. We wonder how anyone could ever bow to an idol made of silver and gold. But is it any less ridiculous to spend our time staring at computers and compulsively watching television? When we get caught up in the buzz, our spiritual life also suffers. We find it hard to devote ourselves to prayer and the study of the Word of God. We have trouble concentrating on spiritual things. We lose our appetite for communion with Christ. We are rather be interchained than to worship and so it is for our spiritual good that god says this in exodus 20 23 do not make any gods to be alongside of me do not make for yourself gods of silver or gods of gold now an important theological principle lies behind this command god is not the kind of deity who can be adequately represented in the form of an idol he is a god who speaks from heaven and so the israelites met him on the mountain in fire and smoke they experienced his splendor and his glory how can anything we are tempted to look at no matter how precious it is or how shiny or how well made ever compare with the real beauty and majesty of god the things of the earth cannot compete with the glories of heaven what is eminent cannot rival what is transcendent therefore rather than getting caught up in all the buzz we are called to turn back to the living god and having reissued his commands against idolatry, God gave Moses a second set of instructions about worship. This time he didn't restate the law, but told the Israelites what to do when they broke it. They were to make a sacrifice for their sins, as Exodus 20, 24-26 says. 
Now, these instructions may seem very strange to us today. Why did God insist on having an altar made of earth and rough stones rather than one crafted by using tools? And what was wrong with raising an altar up on steps? Well, the answer is that God wanted to keep his people from worshiping like pagans, making altars out of square blocks, building up uh, step pyramids, worshiping naked. These practices were common in Mesopotamia. And when the Canaanites worshiped idols, they did so on altars of finished stone, built high for show, as archaeologists have discovered. Now, we also know that Canaanite worship was obscene, combining idolatry with ritual prostitution and other forms of indecent exposure. But God wanted his people to worship him rightly, and this meant avoiding the appearance of idolatry. It also uh, meant making altars from the earth and stone that he created. It meant staying fully clothed. In fact, God later instructed his priests to wear linen and undergarments in Exodus uh, twenty eight forty two to preserve their modesty. True biblical worship is characterized by simplicity and by purity. And in keeping with these priorities, God told his people to build plain altars of earth and stone. John McKay comments, dressed stones were used by the people of Canaan to construct their altars because they were building materials of the highest quality from which all roughness had been chiseled away. An altar made from such costly as an aesthetically pleasing stone would be a tribute to human craftsmanship, but it would be would but it would be defiled from the Lord's point of view because it distracted attention from him and his goodness. The restriction to natural stone would have emphasized that it was a God-given provision and not an act of human conception. Although we no longer build altars for sacrifice, there are principles here for us to apply. One is that God alone has the right to determine how he wants to be worshipped. The Israelites were not allowed to build any old altar. They had to build it according to the instructions of God. We are under a similar obligation today to worship God the way that he wants, not the way we want. Often this means that what we do in church is different from what everybody else does. Far too much of our thinking about worship and evangelism begins with the opposite assumption, namely that we should try to fit in with our culture as well as we can. But in the same way that God told the Israelites not to worship like the Canaanites, he tells us not to pattern our worship after the values of the surrounding culture. God's instruction also teaches us something about the simple beauty that has always characterized true biblical worship. God did not want his people to build a fancy altar that might distract them from offering real praise. All he asked was a simple altar made from the good earth and rough stone that he created. Our worship it should be simple too. You see, what God requires is for us to worship him in the ordinary acts of singing and hymns, saying prayers and petitions, celebrating the sacrament of baptism and the Lord's Supper, giving tithes and offerings and reading and hearing the word of God. Nothing should be done for show. This principle can be illustrated from the life of an inmate preparing for pastoral ministry. He described his pulpit at a Texas prison like this. Given the circumstances, we as inmates come together to hold services and we rotate to preach and teach. Uh, given the opportunity to teach two to three times a month, I praise the Lord. We meet in recreation on one section of a bleacher on a baseball field and use a commercial trash can as our pulpit and pick stones from the ground to hold the pages of the word of God for the person teaching that morning. This is the kind of pulpit God honors, one where the plain teaching of his word is what matters. Now, the instructions of Exodus 20, 24 through 26, it contained many other principles for us to apply. These verses show the absolute necessity for those who lead worship to be sexually pure. When ministers are caught in any kind of sexual sin, it always causes a scandal and rightly so. The purity of God's worship, it demands the decency of his ministers. These verses also teach us something important about the location of worship, which God says in Exodus 20, 24. Whatever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and bless you. This meant that the Israelites did not have to stay at Sinai forever, as if a particular mountain were the only place on earth where God God could meet with his people. There would be other places for them to worship, especially, you know, the tabernacle, and God would be present there as well. And eventually God would send his Holy Spirit, and then God would be worshiped all over the world, as Jesus said in Matthew 18, 20.
Now, the foregoing principle for worship are all important. The Israelites needed to be careful what kind of altar they constructed. Its size, its materials, its location were governed by God's command. Well, they also needed to be careful what they wore when they approached the altar. But the most important thing of all was what happened on the altar. The word translated as altar comes from the Hebrew word for slaughter. And so the altar was a place to make sacrifice for sin. The book of Leviticus describes Israel's sacrificial system in detail. There are many kinds of sacrifices, all carefully regulated by the command of God. But here in Exodus 20, God mentions two of the most important. The first was the burnt offering, as we're going to look at in Leviticus 1. Sometimes this is called the whole burnt offering because the entire sacrifice was burnt with fire. The burnt offering was a sacrifice of atonement it paid for sin. This was always necessary because the altar was a place where God met his people. Anyone who approached the altar was coming into his holy presence. But we are all sinners and God hates sin. And so before anyone could meet with God, something had to be done about their sin. Hence the need for a burnt offering in which a perfect animal was placed on the altar and then consumed with fire. The word uh, for altar means to rise up, and the idea was that the smoke of the offering would rise to heaven, where God would recognize that a sacrifice had been made for our sin. The one who really deserved to die was a sinner who offered the sacrifice, but instead the sacrificial animal, usually a lamb or a goat, died in the sinner's place, and God accepted this as an atonement for sin. The second kind of sacrifice God mentioned to Moses was the fellowship offering, as we'll see in Leviticus 3. Sometimes this called the peace offering because its name comes from Shalom, the Hebrew word for peace. The fellowship offering also dealt with sin, but it had a different emphasis. It showed what kind of relationship God had with his people once atonement had been made for their sin. Fellowship offerings were given on various occasions, sometimes to thank God for a special blessing or a specific answer to prayer, and sometimes for no particular reason at all, other than to praise God for his glory. Well, whatever the reason, the fellowship offering was a tangible reminder that the people were no longer separated from God, but had fellowship with God. And in recognition of God's reconciliation with his people, the fellowship offering was not consumed by fire. This was the main difference between the burnt offering and the fellowship offering. The burnt offering was burned to a crisp, as its name implies, but with the fellowship offering, only the fat was burned. In other words, the choicest part of the animal was offered to God. The rest was cooked until tender and then eaten by the worshipers as a way of celebrating God and his grace. The fellowship offering was a feast to the glory of God. What is significant here is that God mentions these sacrifices almost immediately after giving his law. God gave his people the Ten Commandments for all of life, ordering them to obey. However, he also knew that they would disobey him, and so he provided a way for them to atone for their sin and come back into fellowship with himself. Both the burnt offering and the fellowship offering were for sinners in need of salvation. Now, by providing a way for atonement, God gave his people everything they needed for their salvation. First, he brought them out of their bondage in Egypt. Then he told them how he wanted them to live. He sent a mediator to make sure they understood uh, well enough to obey. But God knew that his people would break the law, and so he gave them sacrifices to pay for sin and to reconcile them to himself. God has always provided his people with an atonement for their sin. He did it in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve had sinned. God clothed them with the skins of animals. A sacrifice was made for their sin. There was an altar again after the great flood. The world had been judged for its wickedness, but Noah was saved, and when he set a foot on dry land, he made a sacrifice to God. The patriarchs all built altars, as Moses did, and then David. There was always an altar where God's people could make atonement for sin. This was all preparing the way for Jesus to make atonement once and for all. The Bible says in Romans 3.25, God presented him, Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. Christ was the mediator who suffered the law's penalty in our place. And here we discover another way to describe the person and work of Christ. When Jesus was crucified, he made an atoning sacrifice on the altar of God. In fact, the Bible goes so far as to refer to Jesus as our altar in Hebrews 13.10. He is the burnt offering that made atonement for our sins, as well as the fellowship offering that reconciled us to God. 
Everyone who has ever been saved has accepted Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. Whatever sins we have committed, whatever blatant violations of the Ten Commandments, whatever inward sins of a loveless, idolatrous, covetous heart, Jesus died on the cross to save our kind of sinner. No one is excluded here. There is salvation for every sinner who comes to Christ. And in describing Christ's work on the cross, Martin Luther said this, All the prophets saw this, that Christ uh, was to become the greatest thief, murderer, adulterer, robber, desecrator, blasphemer, etc. There was ever been anywhere in the world. He is not acting in his own person now. Now he is not the son of God, born of the virgin, but he is a sinner who has and bears the sin of Paul, the former blasphemer, persecutor, and assaulter of Peter, who denied Christ of David, who was an adulterer and a murderer, and who caused the Gentiles to blaspheme the name of God. In short, he has and bears all the sins of all men in his body, not in the sense that he has committed them, but in the sense that he took those sins committed by us upon his own body in order to make satisfaction for them with his own blood. Now, this explains why we no longer need to make God an altar. The sacrifices have been offered. Atonement has been made. Fellowship has been restored. And it is all through Jesus and his death on the cross. If there is any sacrifice left to offer, it is only the sacrifice of living for the glory of God alone. The Bible says in Romans 12, 1, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Jesus has offered himself as, a, as the sacrifice for our sins, and now it is our privilege and joy to offer ourselves for his service, as Hebrews 13, 15 through 16 says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name, and do not forget to do good works and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Well, I want to thank you for listening or watching today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave. My name is Dave, and today is May 5th, and we've looked at Exodus 20, 22 through 26. Until tomorrow, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to also like, subscribe, or follow Servants of Grace on Facebook, Instagram, X, or YouTube. We appreciate your support.